I'm Yu Mei Wong with the State of Oregon Department of Geology, and I'll be talking about the Portland Hotspot, which is a critical energy infrastructure hub. So I'll be reviewing the hotspot, seismic hazards, uh, critical energy infrastructure reliability uh, or vulnerability, as well as some examples of damage. This is a ground shaking map of, west, of the western U.S., and you can see that Portland has a high uh, probability of ground shaking, and a lot of this is due to the Cascadia subduction zone, uh, as well as local crustal faults throughout the state. Areas in red um, have a higher seismic hazard. In the Pacific Northwest, we have a large um, subduction zone setting with the Juan de Fuga plate that's being subducted beneath the North American plate. That, uh, that boundary is a subduction zone fault called the Cascadia Fault and can produce magnitude 9 earthquakes. Our building codes were very late to reflect the seismic hazard, so we have a lot of infrastructure, including buildings, that are very poorly designed and aren't very capable of withstanding seismic hazards. So what do we expect? From a Cascadia earthquake, we expect to have a magnitude 8.5 or 9. It's inevitable. This geologic process is a continuous process, like a conveyor belt, and we're definitely going to have it. Uh, the ground's going to shake for on the order of five minutes. Um, this includes the coast, the coast range, the valley, and then the ground shaking dissipates as you go further east. Um, there are certain pockets that will get hit hard if they have uh, particular vulnerabilities, such as steep slopes or liquefiable materials. We expect to have a large coastal tsunami that hits the low-lying communities, as well as landslides and liquefaction. With this type of hazard, there isn't any kind of warning like you get with hurricanes, for example. Um, it comes on all of a sudden, and in Oregon, we are likely to have thousands of fatalities, uh, as well as damage to the infrastructure, including this fuel hub, which I'll be talking about. Uh, in Portland, we have the Portland Hills Fault that's indicated in yellow, and then the hot spot that I'm talking about is right along the Willamette River next to the Portland Hills Fault that's indicated by red. In this area, the Willamette River converges with the Columbia River, and we do have a lot of modes of transportation there, including airport, porch, rail, and truck. Uh, this is just an example of a major rail yard in, along the Willamette River. And we also have industry. You can see the map on the left is a map about 100 years old, and Swan Island was really just marshes. And if you take a look now uh, on the um, image on the right, you can see that that area has been filled in with, uh, with poor soils and then developed upon, and, and there's a lot of industry in this area. This is the, this is the kind of um, soils that, when shaken, are expected to have a lot of um, uh, movement, and uh, the structures on top of it are going to have uh, damage. There are a number of hazmat facilities there as well. So on the left, you can see a map that indicates earthquake hazards with Orange and red being worse. This is a combination of hazards from liquefaction, ground shaking amplification, as well as landslides. On the right is an image showing the same approximate area with the hot spot that I'll be showing you next indicated in pink. This is that uh, close up of that hot spot. You can see that along the Willamette River, with Savi's Island at the very tip, um, has a lot of. Uh, artificial fill material that's shown in pink. This is the type of soil that uh, is, is a problem during earthquakes that can tend to liquefy, it can tend to, to spread uh, towards the river and, and down gradient. And on the right is a map of this exact same area showing three, false, three traces of, of uh, faults, including the Portland West Hills Fault. Now, Liquefaction and lateral spreading um, is commonplace um, along rivers. Uh, sections that are typically stable, when you shake them, they can temporarily lose their strength and start spreading down gradient. Uh, the photo on the right is a picture of me um, in 2007 after an earthquake in Japan where there was significant lateral spreading. Um, landslides, I think, we're much more familiar with, but during earthquake shaking, steep slopes can uh, fail. 
And this is just a view of the Portland um, area uh, where there's a concentration of critical energy infrastructure with a photo of a tank farm um, and marine oil terminals on the right, uh, as well as uh, 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 another image there. Um, the fuel terminals and tank farms were largely built decades ago with older practices without seismic design um, in, their in their design and construction. You can see the sheet pile uh, wall with the uh, arrow pointing to it, and, and um, th this type of design is, is, uh, uh, is older. Um, here are a couple of marine oil terminals and tank farms. You can see the um, ship that is docked there that is handling the fuel. Um, these docks are, again, uh, older docks um, under design by today's standards. If we take a closer close look at this, um, these piers are quite vulnerable. You can see the large wooden shim that was uh, uh, block that was put in to the uh, dock to help with ground settlement, as well as the um, quite older foundation type. The tank farms um, also have the same situation with some older tanks, uh, a lot of piping um, without shutoff valves. Um, some of the piping has a lot of corrosion, as well as uh, this LNG tank here. And there are pipelines that um, are underground and buried as well as above ground or below the docks. Um, you can see some of the corrosion problems here. And it's not just the liquid fuel and the natural fuel pipelines that are concentrated here that have uh, impact for our entire state. Um, it's also um, other types of energy infrastructure. We have uh, high voltage electric, communica uh, electric transmission right in this area. And you can see that the um, towers are right near the river where they have a very high liquefaction and lateral spreading potential. These have been analyzed. Um, and you can see that the river is actively eroding away at uh, one of these footings. As far as um, damage, there's been plenty of examples from past earthquakes around the world of uh, damage to all these types of facilities. This is a high voltage transmission tower. This is a transformer that had uh, severe damage. And this is from the 1964 Great Alaska earthquake, which was a subduction zone earthquake. Um, and this shows a timber pile that has been pulled apart by liquefaction and lateral spreading. There are numerous examples of tank damage. This is an example of uh, a tank that pulled uh, away from its foundation and rotated and blew out its roof. You can see that it has what we call an elephant foot style of failure, where it's uh, kind of puffed out at the bottom. And pipes often fail. Um, and it, the resilience of the pipe depends on how it was constructed, um, what the angles are, um, what kind of fittings you have, and, and so forth. This is an example of a pipe failure uh, along a river crossing. One of the issues we worry about are co-located infrastructure. And this is an example of co-located uh, water and gas pipelines where the water um, where the damage is, where the water and the fire are coming out of the same cavity from the road, um, the fire uh, caused damage to the overhead communication lines. And when infrastructure is damaged, there can be many upstream and downstream ripple effects from that infrastructure being damaged. For example, if you have a gas pipeline that goes out um, and water pipeline that goes out, you might first need to secure the gas damage um, before addressing uh, providing, providing water to folks. So what we would recommend is to have a better understanding of this Portland hotspot, uh, what the vulnerabilities are, and what we need to do to improve its resilience um, in order to provide energy assurance to the state. And we would recommend an earthquake risk management approach, 
where we consider identifying the hazards, uh, the risk, engaging stakeholders, um, prioritizing the, the risk, and then conducting risk mitigation in a very cost-effective manner. Thanks.